Transformative scientific advancement affects our everyday lives and greater understanding of the world. At the American Physical Society, we are honored to highlight and celebrate the many diverse backgrounds, journeys, and stories that guide our community of scientists to discovery. Since 1899, APS has advanced physics by diffusing knowledge throughout the globe for the benefit of all. APS Honors is how our community of physicists acknowledge and highlight the dedicated lifelong work of incredible people in the pursuit of knowledge. The future of the scientific community can be found among the ranks of early career scientists. They are known to contribute fresh perspectives, new concepts, and novel approaches to science. APS is proud to provide opportunities for recognition, networking, and growth in this important demographic of physicists. The George E. Valley Junior Prize recognizes an early career individual for an outstanding scientific contribution to physics that has significant potential for dramatic impact on the field. The 2023 recipient is Lena Nesib for the discovery of a massive, previously unknown stellar structure that may have shaped the history of the Milky Way and the development of groundbreaking new methods to study our galaxy's dark matter halo and growth history. For me, understanding dark matter, it feels very detective work. We have so many clues in different fields. It's one of the most major questions actually in physics today. And if anybody finds it, I think it's going to revolutionize the field, really. I grew up in Tunisia. I left for the U.S. when I was 19. Tunisia, I think, still has a lot of sexist behavior towards it, and my brother is a few years younger, but I, feel, I felt like since I was a kid, everybody treated him differently, uh, or respects his opinion more, even though he's younger. Since I was eight, I was like, I'm gonna be a physicist, and somehow that worked. <laughs> I was looking for the best places to do physics research. That kind of led me to the U.S. schools, and I applied. I didn't get in, and then I went to engineering school in Tunisia for one year. And then the joke was, if I'm going to apply to MIT for grad school, and they're going to accept me, and I'm going to say no. They accepted me, and I came, <laughs> because it's, it's an amazing place to be. The first week, my advisor, Jesse Thaler, actually gave me three different projects. Only one of them was dark matter. And he was like, which one do you, are you interested in? And I was like, that one. I just thought it was fascinating. What is dark matter? That is the big question that we have. The way that I like to think about dark matter is that there is this invisible matter, actually, I think that's a better name for it than dark matter, um, that does a lot of the pulling and gravity and it's affecting how stars move and how galaxies move, but we really have no idea what it is. So originally, the original ideas were in the 1930s and then the 1970s about galaxies that if you were to calculate the mass of a galaxy based on the light you see versus based on the way it moves, you will see that there is a huge discrepancy. So there is something out there that you can think of as just like this big phantom, big sphere around galaxies that that is just invisible. And that's what we're trying to figure out. Gaia is a space mission that was released in 2013. The objective of this Gaia mission is to obtain what we call proper motions. So basically you're kind of like pointing a speed gun at the star and trying to measure their velocities. What we were looking at is trying to understand this correlation between stars and dark matter. So basically trying to answer the question, how can the stars tell me something about dark matter? In earlier work, we showed that some stars, which I call immigrant stars, so these are stars that formed in other galaxies and then merged with us. These stars kind of bring in some dark matter with them. They kind of give you a bit of a window towards what dark matter is doing. So I usually tell people that when you start grad school, you're like very confident, you're like, I am so good at this. And then by the end of grad school, 
you'll realize that most things that look strange are obviously mistakes. <laughs> it kind of gets, it gets that in you. When we started to play with the Gaia data, I remember it was like, I think it was 11 p.m. on a Thursday. And the first thing that you do when you get data is to plot it. So you just like make a figure and see what's up. But the thing is, I was looking at, and there was like a bunch of stars that had a very strange behavior, like a clump of extra stars. And I was like, wait, what is that? Like that looks weird and it's not supposed to be there. So at first I thought that I had a bug, <laughs> that I messed up something. For three weeks, I didn't tell any of my collaborators because I was like, I'm definitely messing up something. It kind of hit me in the middle of the night and I was like, oh my God, this is real. And uh, because after all the checks that I've made, it was still there. And that was such a crazy moment because <laughs> you're like, whoa, I saw something nobody else has seen. This is insane. My poor collaborator, Mary Angela, I sent her these crazy messages of like, oh my God, look at this. And then we had like a bit of a virtual sit down. We're trying to figure out how to name this new thing. And the Greek goddess of the night, or Nyx, was a perfect name. Somehow, um, Nyx kind of took off, <laughs> which, was, which was very surprising and exciting. Um, we got the paper published in Nature Astronomy, which I thought was completely nuts. There is so much left to do in terms of understanding dark matter and understanding galactic dynamics in general. I love what I do, but also there are so many amazing women in physics and they are not seen as much as, as they should. And I find that something that I hope to change. Hopefully really seeing me with my curly hair, <laughs> um, just hopefully it makes an impression and you know, young women or people from non-represented backgrounds really um, can see, okay, if this weird North African can make it, <laughs> maybe I can too. I'm hoping that at least building the next generation of physicists is an important part of the job. Physics careers focused on research are an extremely time-intensive undertaking. Add to that, becoming an effective and influential speaker, teacher, and mentor, and you'll find a physicist who is advancing physics in every facet of their career. The Julius Edgar Lienfeld Prize recognizes outstanding contributions to physics and exceptional skills in lecturing to diverse audiences. The 2023 recipient is Albert Laszlo Barbasi for pioneering work on the statistical physics of networks that transform the study of complex systems and for lasting contributions in communicating the significance of this rapidly developing field to a broad range of audiences. We don't think often of how deeply network determines us. Our biological existence is determined by the genetic and the metabolic networks in our cells. Our consciousness is determined by the neural network in our brain. Our social interactions are determined by the social network we're part of. When I started high school, I had no idea what physics is. I was good at math, I was good at literature and many other things. As I started ninth grade, we had our first physics exam. I was the only one who passed. So one reason that I became a physicist is because I was good at it. I started to win physics competitions and sooner or later it became clear that I would like to study physics. I did my PhD and I studied chaos and many other topics of statistical physics. Living in New York, I realized that there are so many complicated networks in the city that really keep the city alive, from the electricity to the computer networks were just being born at that time. And reading about graph theory made me realize how interesting it is that we have these many complicated networks that evolve apparently randomly, but yet they work. 
when we look at the complex network around us, they're driven locally by randomness. You randomly meet people and become or not become friends. The reactions means that randomly particles arrive together and they may or may not react. So the question was, how do these many random processes add up to lead to something that is non-random? I wrote a paper about that and I was very excited about it. I felt like I have a new discipline at my fingers and ended up submitting to about five different journals and no one has published it. And that pattern persisted for another four years. So even though I started working and thinking about networks in 1994, my first true network science papers were only published in 1999. And in 1999, we made this very unexpected discovery that when we looked at the World Wide Web, we mapped it out, it could not be described by the existing random network models. The World Wide Web had a few major hubs, very, very connected nodes that Google and Facebook, that everybody seems to be linking to. And those very, very highly connected nodes could not be explained by randomness. If you are a physicist, everybody knows the American Physical Society, but they're less likely to know a graduate student's page. And that process, what we call preferential attachment, the, the seeking out to the more connected nodes, are responsible for the emergence of major hubs. In those four years, thanks to the World Wide Web, a kind of an awareness of networks has emerged in the scientific community. Interestingly, when our papers got rejected from 94 to 99, no one said that they were wrong. They just said, who cares? And that is what has changed at the end of 1990. Somehow the referees, the community started to say, oh, this makes sense, this is an interesting problem. I often say that network science has a 20-year history, but really during the COVID, everyone became a network scientist. And because that was the moment when Thanks to the spreading processes, suddenly everybody was talking about issues that are only commonly discussed before in a network science setting or statistical physics setting. When COVID arrived in 2020 March, our institute, and in particular Sandra Vespignani, became the modelers for the White House to kind of try out different intervention scenarios. So in many ways, the tools are abstract, but the implications are not. Many of the applications are now in the hands of the people, even if we are not aware of it. Science is not a subject of instant gratification. You have to build your tool set up. And equally important, you need to learn to communicate your ideas to your community. I feel like my role as a scientist is not only just to do the math and the physics, but also to make the community in which I live to understand why what we do really matters. The Society's most prestigious honor is the APS Medal. It is awarded to someone who has transformed the physics discipline, usually over a lifetime of work. Commitment to the advancement of physics through a pursuit of knowledge and dedication to scientific inquiry are hallmarks of the physicist and career honored by this award. The APS Medal for Exceptional Achievement in Research recognizes contributions of the highest level to advance our knowledge and understanding of the physical universe in all its facets. The 2023 recipient of the APS Medal is Sidney Nagel for incisive experiments, numerical simulations, and concepts that have expanded in unified soft matter physics. someone saying aloud behind my back, loud enough so I could hear him, but say, I don't know what's the matter with him. He used to have a promising career in science. The experiment where theory comes to die is certainly, that's above our lab, but it's also uh, what I would say is only part of the story is that looking at experiment leads you to ask the right kinds of questions, new kinds of questions. And it was so palpable that I thought, oh, this is really neat. This is how nature works if you just carefully pull it apart. 
there was some papers that had suggested, well, that you could look at sand and sand piles, and sand piles uh, might have certain aspects of phenomena with them which could be generalizable, universal. And so this is probably the first thing in soft matter that we did, and it was changing for me because on the one hand, it showed that all everything that the theorists had said was wrong, but it wasn't that it was wrong, but what we saw was that nature was so much, much more interesting than what people had thought could happen. We were too snobby to uh, think about, oh, this is real science. What I loved about that was we got to see the phenomena firsthand, as if you want to watch an avalanche, you can see the grains of sand, or the mustard seeds rolling down on top of one another. And you get to really see what's happening. And I, and I love that. And so that was the beginning of my love affair with trying to visualize the phenomena at the macroscopic level. Another area is the coffee stain problem, which is one that we started a number of years ago. I woke up one morning and, you know, of course, like uh, being a little bit of a slob, I hadn't cleaned up my kitchen counter from the day before. And all over it, there was lots of coffee stains from, from the day before. You know, dro drops of coffee had just landed and then they dried out and uh, as the liquid evaporated. Suddenly I realized, wait a minute, this is a little bit bizarre because I had the stain that had just been a drop of coffee there and it's thicker in the center. So that's where there should have been more stain when it dried out. But that's not how coffee stain works. All the coffee stain goes to the outside rim of this. Where did that come from? That drop is sitting there and it's pinned at the outside edge. Then if there's evaporation from that drop as it dries, it comes out from all over that surface. But because there was evaporation at the very edge and the edge can't move, that means that the, the liquid had, to, some liquid had to flow to the edge to replenish that. And so it's always replenishing anything that moves at the edge. And so that brings with it all of the, uh, the stain, the solute in, in the material. I mean, why did it take us so long? I mean, it's kind of an obvious uh, solution at the end. I remember when we, the paper first came out, we got a letter from someone uh, who said, well, look, this is just exactly what I see in my watercolor paintings, as you see the stuff move to the edge. It also uh, leads you to think of scientific uses that it might come into, into play. Look, it always bothered me if people weren't taking me seriously. I wanted to be taken seriously. But I really enjoyed the fact that, okay, uh, here, this, you're not taking it seriously, and oh, now you have to take it seriously. I've felt like an imposter all my life doing this. It's real. Most of the people I value most in science are also feeling this way, and I just hope that uh, it doesn't prevent people from continuing to work just because they enjoy the fun of it. I, I just hope that we can continue to come up with things that challenge people's notion of where, of what really belongs in science, what belongs in physics, and to enlarge that, because otherwise we're in danger of becoming very narrow.